Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios in Wormtown. Lance, how's it going? It's going very well. How are you today? I'm doing well. For this episode, Lance, we're bringing you some audio from our trip to Albany, New York in April. We went to the American Investigative Society of Cold Cases, which is, of course, run by our buddy, Detective Kenneth Maines, who we had on the show back in February. And we did a panel at this conference with John Lorden of Brain Scratch and Mike Morford of Criminology and the Murder in My Family podcasts. Yeah, I just want to say just a huge thanks, first of all, to Detective Maines for inviting us. He was incredibly uh, gracious and welcoming. And also for John Lorden and Mike, they put together... um, sort of a program that we all followed and John Lord had acted as the the mediator of it. And, and and I think the audience really got a lot out of it too, because we went on right after Aphrodite Jones, who was really perplexed by this whole handling of the responsibility of the citizen detective. And she was, she, she was primarily speaking of the staircase and how all this media can go out there and people think they have all the information. And a lot of that does fall onto what we do as podcasters. We have the responsibility to put out information. And so that's sort of what we were talking about when we went up there. And it was uh, kind of a high bar that was set right beforehand. And I think, uh, I think we did a good job. I'm not I'm not trying to toot our own horn, but I think we did a pretty good job countering what could be perceived as like a negative opinion of of true crime podcasters. I think it's pretty difficult for us to tell in our seats because we talk about that stuff all day, every day, pretty much. But the people who are listening to it don't hear that stuff ever or have never heard that because I don't think there's ever been a panel exactly like the one we did. So it's uh, what, what seemed like obvious information to us was not to the people listening and hopefully not to the listeners at home. And it was it's very cool that an organization like ASOC or the American Investigative Society of Cold Cases were would even open their doors to us in the first place because this is a nonprofit that is primarily professional investigators whose mission is to assist in solving cold cases. Right, a very cool society. Yeah, and mm-hmm. they have many different elements of how they would solve a cold case, including forensic experts and people who are experts in the criminal justice system. And just to, to understand that what we do and what citizen detectives do is the, you know, the tide is rising, so they need to address it. And this was the right time to do it. So it's very humbling to be a part of that. It is, and we'll bring you that audio in just a few minutes. But before then, we have a few general announcements The first one is a new live show we have coming up on May 22nd at 6 p.m. in Nashua, New Hampshire, Lance. We're talking to Brianna Maitland's father, Bruce Maitland, private investigators Lou Barry and Greg Overacker, who we've had on the show as well several times, and Chloe Cantor, who's been on the show and uh, has her own new podcast now called True Crime Twins. And this is going to be such a unique experience for everybody. I think I've said this before. Greg Overacker, Lou Barry, and Bruce Maitland hardly ever give any sort of public interview. They do come on the show on Crawl Space once in a while, but it's a very controlled environment. And to have them all together on the stage where you can ask them questions and you can listen to their story. Bruce will talk about Brianna and Greg and Lou, of course, will talk about Brianna. But then we'll, we'll all talk about Bruce's nonprofit organization, Private Investigations for the Missing. And it, it will really be a, a very informative and fascinating show i think people will get a lot out of the q a at the end especially and tickets are available through our website crawlspace-media.com you'll see the little promo image right there on the front page click on that it'll take you to brown paper tickets where you can purchase your pass to the live show i can't wait for that come see us on may 22nd in nashua new hampshire and tickets are selling out fast, so get them soon. And that is the Riverwalk Cafe, 35 Railroad Square in Nashua, 6 p.m. to about 8 p.m. And Lance, I'd be a jerk if I didn't mention our incredible Patreon page that we are just constantly updating now. And we're doing weekly videos, news videos, reactions to the week in podcasting, in true crime, any new story that happens, we're talking about it. Anything crazy happens in our worlds covering the cases we do, we talk about it. Right. And depending on what tier you sign up for, you can get that. You can also get some outtakes of our kind of ridiculous ad reads. We have some pretty classic Madison Reed ad reads in there. We also offer a tier where if you were to go to something, say, the live show on May 22nd, and you wanted to hang out with us in a VIP-type experience, that's on there as well. 
And CrimeCon is rapidly approaching, Lance. Next month, we're going to New Orleans, Louisiana to do a couple of live shows and to hang out with you. But you got to use code CRAWLSPACE19. I've been telling a lot of people about using code CRAWLSPACE19. You do save 10% off your standard pass. And I think people think I'm joking when they say I'm considering going to CrimeCon. And I say, well, you need to, you need to save money on it. 10% off your standard pass. Use code CRAWLSPACE19 if you're considering going. You got to do it. It's going to be a lot of fun. And you got to check out Stitcher Premium as well. You get the entire CrawlSpace archive as well as all the missing Mora Murrays that have been taken offline to this point. And you also get our Creator Commentary Series. The Creator Commentary Series is such a unique experience for us and for the listeners from what we've heard. We get to go back and listen to the old information. You can hear new information. You can hear corrections. You can hear us make fun of ourselves. So it, it really is, a, uh, I guess, a very meta-type experience it is. on all levels. It is, really. And also Unsolved Magazine, the new magazines from the creators of PI Magazine, have featured us in one of their upcoming issues, Lance. And it's a new magazine, and we know the owners, Jim and Nicole. They are lovely people, and we met them several times. Unsolved Magazine is a lot of fun, especially if you like PI Magazine. You will love it. Whereas PI Magazine is more of an industry magazine for private investigators and their services, Unsolved Magazine is geared more towards the citizen detective, and I guess we're sort of a mouthpiece for the citizen detective. All right, so we hope you enjoy this audio from the American Investigative Society of Cold Cases Conference in Albany in 2019. They will be doing one in 2020, so make sure to check it out on their website. That's ASOC.com. And hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you. So it's interesting to see what the public perception is of podcasts, kind of like was mentioned in yesterday's uh, first address by Joe Kennedy also, just that his initial assumption was, you know, I don't need to be doing that. There's nothing to that. And now he's moved to a position of, hey, this was actually helpful in some way. So we're going to touch on some of what's going on with the podcasting world, and we've got some experts here to do that with me. I'd like to first introduce... Tim and Lance from Crawl Space. Tell us a little bit about Crawl Space. How long have you been doing this? How many cases have you covered? Hi there, I'm Tim. Uh, we've been uh, doing Crawl Space since February of 2017. Um, we bounce around a little bit with missing person cases, uh, some murders. We uh, actually interviewed Cloyd Steiger back there uh, just a week or two ago. Um, so that's com- coming out soon. So we'll do uh, interviews with authors and Ken Maines too. We had him on um, a couple months ago as well. Yeah, one of the things that we learned, we started doing um, a podcast exclusively for the disappearance of Moore Murray, and that's reached about 100, ep- well, exactly 100 episodes, and it's a very significant deep dive that we did into that case, but it limited us. We saw the scope of podcasting and how we can talk to family members and criminologists and reporters and try to get information that uh, occurred as close to the crime or as close to the disappearance as possible, which is why we started Crawl Space, so that we can expand into those areas and maybe try to deliver more useful and responsible information out to the listeners, to the armchair and citizen detectives. And right next to me is Michael Morford, who is a co-host on a show I do with him called Three Men in a Mystery, but he's got other podcasts he does as well. Yeah, I host uh, Criminology and The Murder of My Family as well. We've done deep dives into cases like the Zodiac Killer, the Golden State Killer, and we do a lot of cold case coverages now uh, on a case per episode basis. And one of the things I've had success with is uh, bringing in victims, survivors, uh, family members, uh, and law enforcement to help tell the stories because it's more accurate and people probably want to hear from the the, the people involved as opposed to a talking head that's just there on the other end of a microphone. So we've had a lot of luck with that. How long have you been doing it, Mark? Uh, Since 2017, early 2017. And what about you guys? How long have you been at this? Missing Maura Murray started July of 2015. And uh, I'm a little bit different than these guys. I actually got into it on YouTube, and I started in 2015 on YouTube uh, doing a a case called the Elisa Lamb case. And 
even right from the get-go there, I was trying to get as much evidence as I could. I did go to the court date that happened. So I already felt like there was part of an evolution that I wanted to see myself, and I thought I need to step in and do this differently. Uh, her story was being told as pretty much fodder for ghost stories, and there was a real tragedy in that story that I wanted to get to. So uh, I have a show called Brain Scratch on YouTube. I have a missing person show called Searchlight, and I also do a, sh a weekly show called Case Cracked. So not only did I want to cover unsolved mysteries and missing persons, I wanted to see the other side of that, where the cases actually get solved, and what are the mechanisms for understanding how those cases get solved. So all that kind of rolls together in my work. And now I'm also working on two podcasts. One, one is called Crime After Crime, and the other is called Three Men in a Mystery uh, that I'm doing here with Morph. So Morph, I know you kind of touched on it um, when you talked about helping families, and that has been probably what I'm proudest of, in particular with my missing persons show, is I have a lot of family members reach out uh, and thank me for the coverage or want to expand on it and want to be interviewed and come on and do that. Uh, I just wanted to ask you guys, let's, let's start with the Crawl Space crew. Uh, tell me about a particular case where you helped a family or your show helped a family in some way. Sure, one of the main cases that we work on for Crawl Space is uh, the disappearance of Brianna Maitland. And Brianna's uh, case is really perplexing. It's very similar to Mora's case, where it's a young woman who went missing. And she went missing uh, about a month after Mora, so people and the uh, circumstances were similar with the car on the side of the road. And so people try to connect the, the two, so we had a responsibility, I think, at some point we realized that we needed to look into that and either you know, try to connect the dots or not connect the dots mostly to try to eliminate certain things as much as we could. And we, we brought her up on Missing Moore Murray, and Bruce Maitland, her father, reached out to us and said, I'd be happy to do an interview. So we interviewed him, and we realized that we could take that, and that could be sort of the catalyst for Crawl Space. And since then, we've developed a really good relationship with Bruce, with uh, Brianna's friends, with um, uh, Greg Overacker, who's a, a licensed private investigator. And Bruce has started a nonprofit organization called Private Investigations for the Missing. And that is to provide resources to families whose uh, the, the law enforcement has run out of the, uh, let me start over. <laughs> that is to provide resources for families uh, where law enforcement can no longer help them out. So if law enforcement, it's a cold case and law enforcement is um, no longer on that case, they moved on to something else. Uh, this organization is raising funds to pay for private investigators or anything really to stimulate the conversation to provide answers for families. So uh, Tim and I are on the board of that, and uh, Bruce is the founder. And yeah, we've been working with him to try to do something better in that realm. Yeah, that's a really important aspect that I get a lot, particularly when I'm talking to families that have a missing loved one, is there's usually a lot of attention that happens in a missing person case for the first month or two from law enforcement, and then it weans away. And at some point, the family gets upset with law enforcement. And I really try to encourage them to stick together, to try to work together with that. And uh, I've, in, I've had police officers interviewed on my channel that have told me, you know, it's really tough, John, because we're looking at that case and then all of a sudden two or three days later we hear about a missing six-year-old boy and our focus just goes whoop and all of a sudden this other case just kind of gets left behind so um, I think there is a balance that has to be struck in terms of the family kind of prodding the investigators a little bit but keeping that relationship still healthy and just keeping communication open because ultimately I think both sides need each other to help solve these cases yeah, because eventually a licensed private investigator like Greg Overacker is going to need to reach out to law enforcement to get records, to get um, statements, to follow up with witnesses that they weren't able to follow up with. So that relationship has to maintain. Um, it has to be healthy. It has to stay healthy. Yeah, but it, but it doesn't always uh, right. stay, stay healthy. And uh, one thing we found, and, it's pr and you guys probably have too, but um, families of missing persons, uh, they, they are, there's always a tension between law enforcement and uh, the family, and it's, it's very consistent. It, they're, they're hiding stuff, and, and, but, but it's not necessarily that they're hiding stuff. I think it, they're trying to protect their investigation, and there's sort of a natural, um, 
I guess, butting of heads because of that. The families want more information and law enforcement cannot provide more information. Yeah, it's just, it's important to keep that relationship up though because you never know what that case is gonna turn into, particularly with a missing persons case. At some point that could become a murder investigation. It could go to trial. So um, yeah, I really work hard to try to encourage families to keep that relationship up. More if you want to tell us about a case where you felt like you helped out a family? Yeah, I've gotten a lot of requests from, from people, especially from my show Murder My Family, because there are cases that I cover where people's loved one was murdered and, and they feel the case is sitting on a shelf someplace. So each person that reaches out to me, I'm, I'm always happy to help. But the, the case that's probably meant the most to me was uh, the Golden State Killer case. How many people out here have heard of the Golden State Killer? <laughs> if I asked you that question two years ago, it, the hands would be nowhere near what they are now, but um, before he had that name, before he uh, got all this recognition, uh, n most people had never heard of him, and he was California's worst serial predator, uh, if not the country's. And family members, survivors, victims, uh, all had needed a uh, platform to discuss the case and generate awareness and help get the country to know uh, who this guy was. And as far as podcasts, there hadn't been any major coverage. Case File, uh, a great po podcast called Case File, did a series on it and did an excellent job. Um, and then we did that on criminology and uh, you know, some of the sister survivors in that case, uh, Debbie Domingo and uh, Jane Carson Sandler, Michelle Cruz, they asked if I would go with them to CrimeCon to give a presentation on stage uh, about that case, uh, which was an honor to do that because at the time they still, uh, there was not that much uh, recognition for the case and I was happy to help spread that. And then, you know, obviously an arrest came and it just turned into something totally different. But that was a big case that I felt uh, happy to be part of spreading the word with. That was actually my first exposure to you. All of a sudden I had this guy reaching out to me on Twitter, kept saying, hey, you need to look into this. You need to look into this. I'm like, who are you and what am I doing with this case? Um, yeah, for me, I'd say uh, the Colin Madsen case, which was a young man that went to Russia um, on an exchange program and wound up dying out there. And his family has been trying to find the truth ever since. Um, he's been through multiple autopsies, uh, all kinds of different stories. At first, the Russian authorities said that it was ac accidental, or then they said he smoked too much marijuana. He went out to pee in the middle of the night and wound up dying against a tree. Um, but for that, it's really been about helping his mother ever since. We've been in really close contact. Uh, they burned through all of their savings um, trying to move that case forward. And at some point, she reached out to me and she's like, John, I never thought I'd have to do this, but I have to try to figure out some way to raise money and, and can you help us? Um, so I helped her. She, did, she didn't even know how to record a video, basically and I got her on Skype and we lined it up. So um, we recorded and produced a piece and she opened up a GoFundMe and she has actually literally just sent the first $5,000 payment over to her uh, lawyers in Russia to try to keep that case moving forward. So um, that's something that I run into a bit. I don't know if you guys do, but there's also kind of aftercare um, when you're dealing with these families and you get your episode out and you know, I've covered like 600 cases at this point. So there's a lot of people um, but there's still, those stories don't stop just because your episode's over. And you want to be sure that you're serving the good of, of what you were trying to do with that episode originally. Help those families and help them move forward and just be there as a shoulder if that's what they need. Um, so there's a lot of aftercare that winds, at least for, for my day-to-day -day work, that comes up as well. Raising exposure, I think we just touched on that. Obviously a big benefit. Uh, of the podcast format, and even to the point of what Aphrodite was talking about, we need a place for these conversations to start. And that might mean that a podcast doesn't absolutely get it right from the start. As a matter of fact, my show Brain Scratch, I kind of built on the principle of, I'm going to start this conversation, but it's not going to stop here. And that's one of the things that I really like about the YouTube platform is that the comment thread is directly below where that video is. So if someone's watching the video and they wanna see what other people are talking and thinking about, they just scroll down and they get right into it. 
I started Brain Scratch as a two-way conversation where I did the first video, I saw what people thought about it, what other theories they brought up, what expertise they brought into the conversation, and then I rolled that into a follow-up episode about that same case and did that over and over and over, almost refining the information and trying to get closer to the truth. And we're really going through that with Three Men and a Mystery now also. Um, there's you know, the version of the story that gets out in media, and then as you get more ingrained and you get more connections, all of a sudden you start hearing about, oh, that news story wasn't so accurate. This statement wasn't so accurate. So I think that's one of the benefits of the flexibility of the social media space, is we can update it as we go forward. It's not a set piece of television that gets aired, it goes out, and that's that or a documentary, it's, those are very static formats. And for us, it's very fluid. There's a lot that we can do uh, to update things, so. Um, was there a big case that you feel like, in terms of raising exposure, I, for you guys, it's gotta be more on Murray, right? Yeah, I would say so. And, um, and we've definitely made a lot of mistakes on missing more on Murray, and, uh, but, uh, but we correct them, or we at least try our best um, in the next episode or whenever we can. Um, but yeah, as Lance said, we're, uh, we're 100 episodes into Missing Maura Murray. Um, we're not stopping uh, anytime soon. Well, and be believe us, we know that what you're saying, when you're, when you're starting this conversation, if you have your YouTube video, you have the comment section, and there's a conversation, a back and forth, and you're fielding uh, theories and opinions, we totally understand what kind of uh, vitriol can come from that. There's a lot of sort of muck that you have to sift through in order to find the one or two gems that are in there that, that you can then communicate with, because like, like Aphrodite Jones said, the, the, the armchair detectives, what's going on with you guys? And we say that every single day. Like, what, what are you thinking? Moore Murray ran through the treetops, that's why there was no shoe prints. Like, she didn't climb into the tree and swing from tree to tree. That's not even realistic. But you almost, that's going to happen. People are going to say these things. They're, that's going to be there anyway. So we put ourselves in the position to sift through that. And yeah, we do, we do make mistakes, but you do have a, um, an opportunity to then clear up those mistakes in your next episode. And you hope that the people will stay with you. I always say I reserve the right to be wrong. Yeah. I, I think it's, in, it's important to because yeah. when you're first getting started in this, it's like this big scary thing that, oh my God, I'm gonna put my face out there and I'm gonna put this opinion I have out there and what if everyone hates it and they tell me I'm an idiot and they hate my hair and I mean, there's all kinds of- No one hates your hair. Yeah, well, thank you. There's, there's all kinds of weird stuff that goes on just when you're choosing to open up yourself in that way. And there is a certain amount of negative messages, messaging that comes back and we have to learn to kind of, it, it's weird because the ones that sting really hard sometimes have a little nugget of truth and if you can look at that and figure out what it is, you can still get value from those. But then there's other ones where it's like, oh, this person is trolling. I mean, it's, they're literally just coming here because they want to be contrarian to what's going on with this. And it's, it's easy to throw something out on a podcast and just leave it. If you're wrong, so be it and just move on to the next thing you want to talk about. But it takes a little extra effort to go back and say, hey, I was wrong about this, we'd like to correct it. And that's where I think law enforcement can come into play, especially if there's cold cases that you're covering and there's some misconceptions out there, some inaccurate information. Uh, when they are willing to talk with you and say, hey, that's not correct, this is what we have, this is um, something that's accurate, that's very helpful in getting the, the right story out there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's an evolution that I've been going through where when I first started, I was literally just able to review articles, you know, and you re read all you can and you watch all the videos you can and then you come up with this new version of it and you put it back out. Uh, and then as time went on, families opened up and now I'm at the level where it's very easy for me to get in touch with families and to get their perspective on it. But that last hoop to law enforcement has been a really tricky proposition. And I think that's a huge benefit of what we've been talking about here at this conference in particular. We had a great conversation last night trying to figure out some type of intake process for law enforcement so that they get routed to the right shows because there's a lot of different types of content out there, out there varying quality, varying degrees of expertise and to get the right cases in the right hands is really important. So we're trying to figure that out and if anyone out there has opinions on how we can do that, we would certainly love to hear that from you guys. Um, now to touch on it, 
there are some things that are happening in terms of media that I just wanted to get out there um, where social media can be a little bit different than in particular traditional media like television. Um, the first thing is content sustainability where if you get something on your local news, uh, first of all, you're likely to get like a five minute piece on it. It gets broadcast and then it fades away. Now some local news stations do take those clips and they'll roll them into YouTube channels or things like that. I can tell you I look at those clips all the time. They're lucky to get maybe dozens or maybe hundreds of views. So it's not a very popular way of consuming that type of, of media. Um, and if you look at the stats, television news is basically shrinking year over year outside of election years. Uh, according to Pew Research, uh, in 2018, T TV news consumption is down to about 50% of Americans. Half of those viewers are over the age of 65. So that's one of the things that I'm thinking about that's important in terms of getting the right cases in the right hands. If you have a case of a murdered college student, is TV news really the best place for that when half of that audience is over the age of 65 if you're looking to elicit tips? When it comes to the college age, 18 to 29 year olds, you're talking less than 8% of that viewing audience is that age range where you might be targeting for your particular case. So it's important to realize that kind of stuff. And you know, podcasting, the numbers are growing year over year. Uh, in 2017, Nielsen said that 50% of all US homes were podcast fans. 60% of people actually knew what a podcast was, <laughs> which we do run into, right? Every day. Yeah. How do I set my DVR for the podcast? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can't pod, you can't DVR a podcast. Not yet. Um, but you don't have to because they're very easily accessible, and most good podcasts will make sure that they're listed on numerous different services. So if you just go to iTunes for your podcast, you can find it there. If you go to Stitcher or you have a Stitcher account, you can find it there. Um, YouTube is another interesting beast because it's also seen as a search engine, and it's number two in the world. So many people are used to using YouTube for, hey, I need to unclog my sink. You know, how do I do that? Um, so they're doing that in the crime space also. And that has, over the past few years, really developed a new type of YouTuber. Um, typically, it is a young female uh, that is going over a case and, and retelling the story. And there's a lot of those channels that are just exploding in popularity right now. So true crime on YouTube, it's still kind of young but the growth that I'm seeing there is crazy. And in terms of missing person cases in particular, I see a benefit to the YouTube format because we're able to actually show images of the person that's missing. We're able to go over maps and show where they were last seen. Um, so the visual format, I think, does add something specifically for missing person cases. Yeah, and I think you, you hit on it earlier with the comment section on YouTube. One of the problems with podcasts, you know, you go to iTunes or, or whatever, there's nowhere to write a comment. So a lot of the commenters congregate on the YouTube channel, and that's why we'll upload our stuff to YouTube too to see what people are saying. Because um, otherwise, it's not that easy to find. Yeah, and that makes a real good natural mechanism for fostering an audience. Because not only are they coming there to see one of my videos and they want to get my take on something, all of a sudden they have friends and relationships that they're developing in those comment sections. And these people band together on certain causes if we're looking to raise money or something like that. So that's another big aspect to all of this for us, I think, is to keep fostering those helpful communities and have those people ready for the specific cases that touch them so that they can move and act on that stuff as well. Um, and one of those big things is fundraising. I have a friend that's a YouTuber. He's actually the third man on the Three Men in a Mystery podcast. His name is Gray Hughes. And he has a following of about 30,000 subscribers, I think, on YouTube. Um, he decided that he wanted to help with a John Doe case, unidentified body that was found, and he wanted to raise some money. Uh, he told his audience about it, and within two days, he had raised $3,000. And outside of that, connections were made where people were like, hey, Gray, you need to talk to DNA Doe Project. There's a whole website that is focusing on trying to do this. And they're doing similar analysis to what Parabon's doing in terms of familial DNA matching. Um, but 
their rates are a bit cheaper. <laughs> so with $3,000, my friend with only 30,000 YouTube subscribers essentially can solve three cases using that service. And now they've connected and gotten together. So our network has just gotten a little better, a little bit bigger, and we're helping other families. And that's really great for smaller departments that may not have a budget to do that kind of work when you can fundraise like that and generate income for uh, doing that testing. That's that's pretty helpful. Even if, if they even know about it, which is the first hoop. I mean, we, we ran into this with the case we're covering on Three Men and a Mystery. A um, bit of a smaller town area. Do they know about Parabon Nanolabs? Do they know that if they have a DNA sample, they can kick it into them and they can get a new list of suspects to look at, uh, which is another way that our type of content can be helpful just in terms of targeting a particular area, asking a very direct question of that area, and then seeing what happens. And in case you haven't heard, in that case in particular, they did contact Parabon. They now have a suspect in custody on that case and five charges filed. And, and Joe Kennedy mentioned yesterday when he was speaking that the, the um, genealogy is great. It's not the only tool. It's just one of the newer tools. But in, in my opinion, it's going to be just a, a bigger and bigger tool that can be used going forward. And if there's people out there with cold cases and DNA that has a, a usable profile, they should be racing to get genealogy done because it's just a, it's just a, a great, invaluable tool, I think. He also threw a word of caution in about it, and we're kind of feeling that with this case in particular, too. You know, if you have the DNA sample come from a sex act, you then have to prove that it was an unwilling sex act. And if the people were murdered and you don't have any DNA that's tied to a weapon of any kind, how do you put that case together? Morph has done some excellent interviews with both Jedmatch and Parabon, and they were very clear about the fact that their analysis does not actually solve cases. Their analysis essentially gives you suspects, and then you have to go back to traditional police work to actually solve that case. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been an interesting time and helping to spread that awareness with other departments that might not know about is certainly a big thing. Um, back to helping causes real quick. Uh, I regularly donate thousands of dollars every year to multiple causes on my channel. If I'm covering a particular missing persons case and I see they're doing a GoFundMe, I'll tell my audience, hey, they're doing a GoFundMe and because of you guys, we're contributing to this as well. Uh, how have you guys helped uh, some of these cases in terms of fundraising specifically or giving back? Uh, yeah, we, we have a GoFundMe in um, Maura Murray's case um, to do any kind of GPR, ground penetrating radar, or any kind of um, testing, uh, things like that. Um, we asked the community, and I think we raised, was it like seven grand or something? Or? Yeah, overall it was about 9,000. Okay, Yeah. very good. Um, Right, so that, that's, uh, that's also um, used for you know, travel expenses, if any searches, uh, cadaver dogs, just anything that, that the family will look at and say, yeah, I think that this, and the community as well, I think this is a good use of that money. Uh, there's also the private investigations for the missing, which one will raise money, but it also has introduced us to a, a lot of people like uh, Daniel Sleeper's case. Um, we were, this is a, a young woman who went missing. So we were introduced to that case and, and we, can, we can cover those cases and we can start a conversation about, about those cases. So in addition to the funding, it's also a voice. I think we, with Three Men and a Mystery in particular, we went into it saying, all right, do they know about the genealogy? Do they know about the cost, the the three thousand to seven thousand dollar, you know, range of cost on that? And is it something they have in their budget? If not, we'd like to help raise that. And if if they don't need the money, so be it. If we raise some money, we can put it towards uh, another cause, something to support that area, or maybe the victims in that case, uh, something that their families would approve of. Um, so uh, when we generate that money, it's going towards a good cause, and, and the first plan is to put that towards the investigation and helping solve the case, um, and if it can't go there, we find someplace else to, to put it that goes toward a good, good cause. Yeah, and just to be clear, it's not like money is an easy resource for most of us up here. I keep joking about, hey, I'm rolling in YouTube dollars over here. Um, when it came to Three Men in a Mystery, we actually got in touch with a sister of one of the victims, and we told her we hadn't made a cent on that and you know we spent a couple hundred bucks on production so far but once we had her on the phone we were like we would we would pay for this right now like we'll give you the money right now if, if you can just help get this analysis done 
Um, so it, it really, for me personally, especially, it comes from just a totally different place. I started doing this at a total flat line, making absolutely nothing at all. Uh, I might not be a flat line anymore, but uh, I think it's just as important to remember that that's where I started with this. It was to give and to really help these cases. And how can we do that? How can we do that with law enforcement in particular? Um, the obvious thing is raising exposure, trying to elicit more tips. Hopefully we're doing that with good information, but maybe we're doing that with bad information too. Maybe if we go out there and we say, hey, we think this guy had a red sweater, all of a sudden tips are getting called in that no, 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 we know that guy and he was wearing blue. Um, I do think there's an opportunity that law enforcement could reach out or that we could contact them in some way and get some of that information clarified. Uh, in particular for the three men in a mystery case, there was this really interesting aspect where the car that was found with two dead teenagers in the trunk had the driver's license of one of the teenagers on the dashboard. And because of that, a lot of lore kicked up around the possibility of were they pulled over by law enforcement? Is law enforcement responsible for shooting these two girls? They were also killed with a nine millimeter, same type of weapon that law enforcement carries. After working on that case for months and finally getting in touch with someone closer to the case, we were told that uh, actually the driver's license was put up there by law enforcement and they were taking a picture of it and that picture got leaked to media and all of a sudden the story ran out there that oh my god the driver's license was on the dashboard the whole time and doesn't that point to the fact that you know someone was either faking that they were law enforcement or it was law enforcement for us to have that information to be able to put it out we can now take a huge circle of rumors that has literally been going on for decades and kind of put it to rest so I do think there is benefit in terms, especially if law enforcement is dealing with a rumor of that nature. Yeah, I think sometimes podcasts can sort of create the rumor or the, the chatter, like you said, in a false way. Like I remember when we talked to you guys about that case, that was like one of the most fascinating parts. And I actually, I didn't know that that was put there by law enforcement. So that's great um, to know that that's not a you know part of the mystery anymore. But yeah, I think, it's probably annoying for, for law enforcement to get all sorts of tips, especially on incorrect things like, like that. Um, but, uh, but I think stirring the community definitely can help. Yeah. I, I do hear from time to time law enforcement that will get frustrated, like with the Delphi case. Uh, you know, they've been clear a couple times that they put out a composite of a killer of two young girls and all of a sudden they were just flooded with people that were sending Facebook pages and I think it's this person hey look at this guy's face doesn't he look like the composite and I've really tried to work with my audience in terms of educating them to this is not what they're asking when they put a composite out they don't want you to go looking on Facebook and, oh look this guy happens to live in the area and he wears the same kind of hat um, you know, they're looking for a more personal connection, someone that was at, there at the time that might have recognized that guy that saw him get into a type of vehicle, something like that. So there is a bounce back effect when it comes to social media. And I understand that law enforcement is certainly frustrated by it occasionally. Um, but almost to the same effect that we go through, you have to sometimes weed through that to get through to the few good nuggets of information that might come in with all that. Uh, also, some of the departments we deal with don't have public information officers, you know, so are we asking someone that would regularly be on the street to spend time with us to, to let us clarify this information? Um, I know there's a lot of challenges to working all that out, but we're certainly thinking about it and looking for more feedback on that. More, if you want to tell us about the 40-year-old uh, cold case that you were working on recently? Yeah, so I reached out uh, to a, a family that had a murder case from 1980 in Iowa and a, a couple was murdered in a hotel room and they were uh, attacked with a hatchet and killed with a hatchet and it, it turned out that the man uh, was married to another woman and it seemed like a crime of passion and they thought it might be a jealous ex, ex of, of the girl that he was with or the, the man's wife and they there's a lot of uh, r indirection they went down the wrong path thinking locking in on this is a crime of passion a crime of jealousy and they went down that path and it may have cost them at looking at other suspects because the person they locked in on had an airtight alibi he was at work witnesses saw him there at a time card um, so the case pretty much you know since 1980 just went 
really cold. And I started doing a podcast on it, and word got out, and it generated a little bit of uh, local media coverage. Uh, some of the newspapers there started running articles about the case again. And uh, I had the uh, the widow of, of the male victim on the show uh, to, to talk about her, uh, how that affected her, and, and how uh, she was initially a suspect because they were looking at anyone that might be jealous of, of that relationship. And one of the things that transpired was she put me in touch with the sheriff in the, in that cold case and he agreed to talk with me on the air and he was very forthcoming you know it wasn't one of these sorry it's an open investigation we can't talk about it and at the end of that conversation he, he was telling me about dna about evidence about suspects he was he, there wasn't much that he was leaving out and at the end of the conversation when i i turned off the recording i said wow you were really open i appreciate that why were you so open with me? Because you're not, it's not customary to get that kind of uh, openness. And he said, because this is 40 years old, this case, if we've got to pull out all the stops now because it's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. So I'm, I'm pulling out all the stops. This is the last chance to, to generate um, leads. And, and if anybody watched Ken in the Zodiac series on the History Channel, he caught a little bit of flack from some of the law enforcement down in Riverside, California, because they've bungled the investigation. I'm a big law, law enforcement supporter, uh, but in that case, they, they bungled that investigation. And um, Ken called them out and said, you know, it's been 50 years and doing what you're doing now, how's that working out for you? And uh, they're the old school uh, mentality of uh, a different thinking. And they need to be forward thinking because things that worked back 50 years ago have led to that case being unsolved 50 years later. And I think this uh, sheriff that I talked, about, talked to about that case in particular had Ken's thinking that they needed to try something different to, to try and um, uh, spark that case. I had a private investigator reach out to me at one point. He just wanted to publicize more information about a particular case. And then I later found out that he had also set up a website about the case and he was essentially trying to drive who was responsible for committing that act to the website because he was tracing all the IP addresses <laughs> and trying to figure out who was going to see that info. So there's a lot of creative ways I think that an investigator could use the social media level and uh, if you have ideas about that, please reach out to us. We're, we're certainly willing to try anything to help these cases. That's ultimately the biggest thing. Anything you guys want to touch on before we close out on how we can help law enforcement? Well, we know that uh law enforcement listens to the shows as well. That they, they, maybe it's not the specific detective in charge of the case, but we know that they have people that will listen to the show and any corrections that we can get directly from law enforcement, we don't have to you know, go into specific details about something, but if there's a way to correct something or to add to something, we're totally open to do that. I think that that's an important element that we can consider. Uh, and also we've done live shows where law enforcement has looked at the list because when you buy a ticket you put your name in it's voluntary they've looked at the list of people attending the live shows and if that's something that we can help with it's just you know it's a it's a couple hundred people but still you never know yeah yeah i would think in you know the 600 cases i've covered I, well honestly in a few of them i feel like i've spoken to someone that might be responsible but i'm sure that someone that's responsible has at least viewed some of that stuff um, all right, so I want to start at least some time for the Q&A. It looks like we've got about 15 minutes left, and I want to start by asking my own question first, because <laughs> this whole hour hasn't been that so far. Um, Tim and Lance in particular, uh, this is something that I personally don't do a whole lot of, is try to balance comedic content or being lighthearted with some of the cases, but Tim and Lance do a bit of that on their channel, so I just wanted to ask you guys, uh, how do you feel about balancing what some people might say is comedic content with difficult stories like this? Um, I, I think a lot of times we, we you know, we're, at, we're old friends, so we, we joke around a lot. Um, and at the, at the beginning of an interview, I think we'll try to kind of make it loose and, and get a laugh or two. Um, and a lot of times we'll end up cutting that because it's just banter with the guest um, to, try to try to loosen things up a little bit. Um, I don't, it's not really something we do too much in, in the podcast, um, but there are a lot of true crime podcasts that kind of blend that comedy and um, tragedy. 
And uh, it's, it is kind of a natural uh, thing because they're actually pretty similar when you break them down, comedy and tragedy. Yeah. Not to get super like philosophical about it. Um, Please. But, I'll, <laughs> but, I, but I will. No, we actually spoke with uh, Cloyd um, the other day, and he's former law enforcement, and we were like, you're so jovial. And he's talking about um, like psychosexual assaults, and, and then we, we start joking about something else. And I think what has to happen is you have to have the, the good and the bad. You have to, if, you, if you're going to talk about all of this, all of this awful stuff, all of, like people and families that are missing, you know, a daughter or a son and where'd they go and, and it's like nonstop, it, you're going to tune out people. People will not, people need a balance. And I think while we don't specifically focus on a comedy element, you just, you need to sprinkle something in, in there so that people can have another emotion aside from, holy God, this is tragic. You know, you need to have that tragedy and comedy. And, by Madison Reed uh, hair products. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think Dr. Henry Lee would probably agree with you guys. I don't know if you saw him yesterday, but I thought I was at a comedy show for about half of that talk. <laughs> um, very entertaining speaker. Um, all right. So, any questions out there? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've heard you talk about how you help families. I've heard you talk about how you help raise money for needed investigation. Um, and I've heard you talk about how maybe you even get a cold case reopened by police. What I haven't heard, and maybe it's there, I just don't know, how many times do you hear law enforcement say, hey, because of something somebody heard on a podcast, we got a lead, we got an indictment, there was a trial, and there was a conviction. How often does that happen? Uh, I can tell you I've closed missing person cases based on information that came in to my channel and I have been thanked by law enforcement. Yes. Uh, I have been thanked by the FBI for passing along tips they hadn't heard of before, but not to a conviction point on that particular case. Have you guys had any anything in terms of closing cases out that far? Not personally, but there's a, um, there's a podcast out now that was asked, and I, the name's escaping me, I'm sure somebody out there knows, uh, was asked to take their content down because it was going to interfere with an arrest they made. The there you go. So um, some, of the, some of the things that come out in these podcasts uh, are relevant to, to later on the investigation. And, um, but in, in, to your point, if, if, if investigators are looking for help and looking for, we need to get word about, uh, about this case, we get millions of downloads per month here. So if you're looking for the opportunity to get attention on case, reach out to us, reach out to different podcasters because there's a way to get that out there and generate tips and leads and cases. And you never know, one of those tips that come in uh, or if they just share it on social media, maybe someone is the right person and comes forward with that last uh, piece of information that solves a case. And that was a great question. Um, I think when you're looking at, at a cold case, typically the ones that we look at are over five years old. So 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, that's a long time for information to just store, sort of stay dormant, you know? And podcasting in comparison and this public sourcing of information through podcasting is relatively new. So not like we're seeing a ton of um, open and shut, like closed, like whoop, close the books on that one, but we're seeing movement in cases. And we're seeing movement in Brianna's case and in Moore's case and uh, suitcase Jane Doe from Pennsylvania. And we're, just, we're seeing the wheels starting to turn again. And especially with Moore's case, we've seen a lot of those uh, red herrings or, I mean, rumors, uh, people of interest, um, locations that people have talked about, bodies are buried under. We've seen, we've done GPR, we've raised the community awareness of it. and. Recently with Morris case, they went into law enforcement, went into a location and did a GPR and had cadaver dogs and determined that there was nothing. And while that was sort of a gut punch to the family and to the community that had put the, put the uh, awareness out there, I, I, I wanted to say put the pressure on, but I don't really think that they reacted to the pressure. I think they were aware of the, of the reality of the situation. And they said, you know, we'll go in there. We'll use the resources and we'll, we'll put the cadaver dogs down. They'll, they'll, we'll dig. So they, they did their own thing and they came out and si they said there was nothing, which Exactly. So now, now you don't have to look at that anymore. Now you can, now you can turn your attention to something else. So there's movement that we're seeing. 
But, uh, but I don't think um, law enforcement really wants to do that uh, in, in certain ways. Like, I don't know, maybe that would open the door too far um, for, for more of this. It just, it doesn't seem like it's, uh, it's something that will, uh, or certainly hasn't happened, that uh, like a press conference where... Uh, we're going to thank this particular show. <laughs> yeah, we're going to thank Mike Moore for, for, right. uh, <laughs> for uh, solving the Golden State Killer case, or, or Michelle McNamara, who wrote the book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark. Um, right, it came out right around the time he got solved, and there was sort of a natural um, belief that that helped, but she's never going to get a thank you from police. So hopefully that does change at some point. I've also had people reach out to me and say, I can't tell you why, but I know that your information really helped this particular case move forward. Like, you know, I'm married to a cop and I can't tell you why. Oh, cool. So who knows? Who knows? We're just doing our best trying to get that information out. Um, Ten days ago, I had a missing person stay in New York State. Uh, I run an organization called the Center for Hope and bring in families of missing people pretty much all over the country. I have a lot that come. Uh, one of my main speakers was uh, from Oklahoma. But anyway, I am currently involved in two podcasts because of my missing daughter. Um, I get interviewed by the, all these little things that you touched on while your conversation. I get interviewed by press all the time. And when I see myself, Repeating, I say, I didn't say that. What are they doing to me? You know, they're really trying to make this very juicy. Now, my case is out there. It's been out there. I continue to keep it out there with the different things that my, uh, my deceased husband and myself have done over the years. Um, so people know me. They know my case. I went to South Carolina. I was waiting in an airport. And somebody walked up to me and knew who I was. I was like, who? They don't have you know me. But anyway, just the fact that podcasts seem to be working. Mm -hmm. The first podcast I was involved in, within uh, two, I think two episodes, a man in uh, North Carolina <coughs> called and said, how come the police didn't interview me? Yeah. He was living in Albany at the time my daughter went missing. And he knew all about, you know, my daughter. He knew about other, you know, factors in the case. And the police didn't interview him. So that worked because my police went down and visited with this guy. But, you know, nothing came of it. But, you know, hopefully somebody's going to see this. Right currently, right now, there's a podcast going on. It's called Upstate Unsolved. Mm -hmm. And um, my daughter is the... the first person that they've done on this upstate, uh, up state of the south. Um, hopefully, it's going to bring up some information. I don't know what, what it's drummed up at this point, but, you know, I just, yeah. I know all the factors that you talked about, uh, Laura Murphy, uh, Brianna Maitland, these people were people who called our office, the families of these people. My husband talked to them. Uh, my husband talked to people you know, with uh, one of the family members from the three girls that were missing in Cleveland. And um, the mother was told, you might as well forget about uh, her daughter, and, and that was Amanda Berry. Forget about her, she's probably deceased. And the mother died before Amanda Berry was found. Yeah. So, you know, I know about a lot of these cases you're talking about. Um, my office. Sometimes we'll get 50 calls a week from families from this people. What's the name of your organization? The Center for Hope. The Center for what? Uh, the Center for Hope. The Center for Hope. We're based in this area. Well, thank you very much for doing that type of work. It is so important that these families make connections with each other so they can share those types of experiences. How often do we hear about those cases where a family is told, you know, you shouldn't even be looking, this person is deceased? Uh, or families that have experience with psychics that reach out to them, uh, people that are fishing for money in all kinds of different ways, people that are asking for, uh, hey, I'll give you the information of where your loved one is, but you need to you know, send me $2,000 before you get it. There's just a lot of terrible things that these families go through, and it's wonderful to know there's organizations like that that let those... It was approached by a PI, a 
couple of weeks ago, he said, I'll help you with missing persons day. And I said, sure, well, I didn't know he was a PI. Mm -hmm. And last week he met with me and he handed me this pile of papers. He said, I've been going over your case. And I said, what's this mean? I'm going to have to pay you to do something. He didn't charge you, did he? No, I wasn't paying. <laughs> but my, you never know what the PI is the problem. <laughs> my case is out there. Um, you could go on the internet, all you have to do is see my daughter's name, yeah. and there's 10,000 things about Suzanne on the, on the internet because of my husband and I working to keep her name out there mm -hmm. in the media. Yeah. What's your daughter's name? Suzanne Wilde. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, the difference sort of between like a, like a news segment on, on a missing person case uh, is like five minutes. And you know we we can we've done a hundred episodes, but if we talk to somebody, it's like an hour. We talk for an hour, so I think that uh, it helps the person. We've actually heard recently uh, from a family member that it, it's therapeutic talking to us. Um, but I think the audience sort of generates a more natural connection when they listen for that long and when they hear people kind of bare their soul in that way. Whereas a news outlet, the interview might actually be an hour long, but it's cut down to five minutes. Yeah, and I think that's where you get that experience that you're talking about where you're like, I didn't say that, you know, because they're gonna take a sound bite and they're gonna build up a little arc to that sound bite that try to make it sound as, as juicy as possible, which is something I never consider with any of the content that I create. Uh, any other questions out there? I think we got time for one more. Hi, well, I'm researching and developing my podcast, and my biggest thing is, I got the logo, I got everything else, and I used to be a prosecutor, a public defender, and in my area in Southern Illinois, there's over 400 of these cases sitting out there. My thing is, how do you pick the first one? What's, how did you come across the first case? That, uh, Just jump in. <laughs> it's got to be the one that you're most passionate about, and Nowadays, with the number I've covered, I'm looking to try to cover cases that aren't getting a lot of coverage. That's kind of where I'm trying to focus. You know, if there's a documentary out about it already or a bunch of TV shows, there's a certain level of exposure where it's like if someone wants to look into that case, they could find that information pretty easily. If I find a case where I only have two or three articles on it and I know there's a family hurting and yeah, and it would lift their day just to bump into that video and say, wow, someone cared enough to put together a 20 minute or a 30 minute segment on this. That's where I'm focusing now. So I would say focus on the thing that pulls your heartstrings, really. The first, the first case I did was something I was just so passionate about because I saw this girl's story just being misused by the internet for all this ghost story crap. And I was like, we need to pull this back to reality and give some, bring some dignity to this conversation. So, um, but in, that's one of the great things about podcasting. We're recording here right now. I mean, in terms of equipment. We are recording a podcast right now. Yeah, yeah. So you can all clap if you want to be heard on the podcast. Um, oh, there we go. Now you can listen back and say, that was me. Um, but that's one of the great things is just the format is so light. It's easy to produce. Uh, on that level, you know, it could be really tough in terms of research and how much work you have to do before you get to the hitting the record button. But it's also so easy to consume. There's people that are listening to podcasts on their drive to work while they're at the gym. Uh, it, it's just it's radio for a new generation, and they're queuing up all their favorite shows and just burning through them one after the other. There's people that listen at work, and depending on what type of work you do, that could be eight hours of listening. 